It was the morning of November 5th, 1966, and I knew that we were in a bad situation. We were in the jungles of Vietnam's Tay Ninh province and found ourselves in a suicide mission. Casualties were mounting, and due to the dense vegetation, I couldn't tell what progress was being made. While Private First Class Chuck Dean was sketching out a map of the North Vietnamese Army's bunker location on the ground, an M60 machine gunner to our right front was hit in the legs and fell, unable to move. I was angry. I picked up the machine gun and told Dean to help me link as much ammunition as we could in a continuous belt, which I placed around my neck. I told him, you're my assistant gunner. Get the rest of the ammo and let's go. I took off straight for the sound of the enemy guns. When I finally came upon the North Vietnamese army positions, I fired the machine gun at three bunkers to my right front. As I turned, I could see a surge of soldiers moving forward, throwing hand grenades into the trenches and firing their weapons at the enemy bunkers. Making my way along the trench system, I was wounded by an enemy grenade. I forgot momentarily that a six foot seven inch company commander makes a good target. There was profuse bleeding from my left side, but the adrenaline was surging too fast for me to feel much pain. One of my NCOs grabbed the M60 and said, sir, we got this now. He was right. I was not supposed to be fighting this battle by myself. After giving instructions to withdraw, I became aware of an eerie silence on the battlefield. We had gone from a cacophony of continuous firing and explosions to an absence of any sounds. I kept thinking, what happened? Where did the North Vietnamese go? I was spotted by some medics who pulled off my blood-soaked fatigue shirt to extract shrapnel from my back, stop the bleeding, and apply dressings to my wounds. As I sat on the floorboards of the helicopter during the airlift back, my thoughts were with these tough wolfhound soldiers whose indomitable spirit had made all the difference. We had 13 killed in action and 31 wounded. With tears rolling down my cheeks, I reflected on how they never wavered, never hesitated. They simply carried out this difficult mission with courage and determination. The Alpha Company Wolfhounds had demonstrated the 27th Infantry Regimental motto, no fear on earth. They were, to the very last soldier, standing tall that day. That was an abridged passage from the book, Standing Tall, Leadership Lessons in the Life of a Soldier, written by Lieutenant General Retired Robert Foley and narrated by Colonel Retired Scott Halstead. General Foley's actions in Vietnam single-handedly destroyed three enemy positions and allowed wounded members of his battalion to be evacuated to safety. For his heroic actions that led to the success of the operation, General Foley received the Distinguished Medal of Honor. It was one of countless moments of bravery and insight over his 30-plus year career. In today's episode, our hosts sit down with General Foley to discuss how someone who graduated near the bottom of his West Point class ended up a hero, the lessons that basketball taught him, the importance of walking around, and yes, share a story about how falling into a well led to greater camaraderie. I'm Carrie viro and this is Army Matters. Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie C. Smith. And today I'm here with my best buddy, my good friend, my battle buddy from the Pentagon, SMA Dan Daly. Dan, how are you doing today, man? Sir, I'm doing great. It's good to be on the show with you. You know, I am starting to enjoy this. Yeah, so am I. You know, we have a lot of fun. We do. A lot of fun do. doing what we do. Can, can you imagine that that we, we could have had this much fun in the Pentagon? No. But they wouldn't let us do a podcast in the Pentagon, would they? I think there's actually a law that's written somewhere that you're not allowed to have fun in the Pentagon. Oh, yes, you can. We had fun in the Pentagon, but mostly it was picking on other people, though, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Let me ask you a question. Sure. What's your most heroic battle that you fought in when you deployed? Hmm. 
since I'm not an infantryman, mm. probably just keep it keep it my soldiers alive, <laughs> driving up and down the road. Uh, you remember RF one when all the crazy stuff was going on? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it it was a crazy time, and and while we have uh, a lot better technology now, than that time frame, you were like, okay, this GPS says this. Remember the first GPSs that we had? Oh You're yeah. Trying to figure out <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where we were and what those things were. Uh, so that's probably my my most heroic piece. Get my people in the places they need to be, and going to the place where we need to be, even when the the staff says, "Oh, you don't really need to be there." Yeah. How about you, Dan? Well, mine would be the Solder City battle. Um, Solder City. Yeah. Um, now you got to explain to our people what was going on in Solder City. So, in about um, you know the mid the mid section of the war in Iraq. 2006, seven, eight, yeah. nine? Yeah, okay. seven, seven through nine, 2007 right. through 2009. There was a big uprising by the two right. uh, religious factions in Iraq, and that was Sunni and the Shia. I remember that. So it was almost like a civil war going on between them in the midst mm -hmm. of us, um, you know, trying to rebuild the country. And unfortunately, because of the, the ongoings that was happening in uh, Baghdad, they were firing mm -hmm. rockets from what was previously called you know, a safe zone over in Sadr City into mm -hmm. the green zone, which is where we were trying to establish governance. Mm -hmm. We got order to go in there. And uh, it's the most inhabited part of all of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it was a pretty tough battle. And, but yeah. you know what? There were so many of my soldiers were heroes. And that, yeah. that's really what we're going to talk about today, isn't that's it? That's right. Yeah. And, you know, what was your, what was your rank then, uh, SMA? I was the Brigade Sergeant Major. Brigade Sergeant, so mm -hmm. you had about five, five to five to seven thousand soldiers that were doing a lot of hard work every day. Yeah, yeah. and I'm proud of them, and they were heroes. Yeah, and we're going to talk about one today. Today we have the honor of introducing Lieutenant General Robert Foley, a Medal of Honor winner for his heroic action in Vietnam, graduate of West Point, and the author of a book called Standing Tall: Leadership Lessons in the Life of a Soldier. Hey, I'm fired up. Let's do it, Dan. General Foley, welcome to the Army Matters Show. Great to be with you today. So now, General Foley, you're a Medal of Honor recipient, one of my heroes, a legendary general, and now an author, which is kind of ironic because as a young child, your mother didn't really encourage you to read books. Can you tell us about your childhood? I was born and raised in a small blue-collar residential community Armadale, Massachusetts, uh, about 20 miles west of Boston. Okay. I had a pretty uh, happy childhood. Uh, we lived near the Charles River, so I went swimming, boating, canoeing, fishing. And I loved to read. And the Armadale Public Library was right down from Burrell Elementary School. And so on the way home from school, I go there, get some books, bring them home. I really enjoyed it uh, until one day my mother decided that reading books is a sign of laziness. Oh, Okay. And so she told me, she said, I don't want you to bring home any more books. And so I uh, uh, was not too happy with this turn of events. And so I decided I'm going to go get some books anyway. And so what I did was I brought them home and hit them under my father's sofa chair in the living room. I um, would get up Saturday morning early when nobody had to go to school or go to work. And my brother was nine years older and he, he didn't have to go to school, so uh, I real early I'd sit there in my father's sofa chair and I'd read these books. And then one day I was really engrossed in one of these books, and uh, I looked up and my mother was standing there. Oh, oh! <laughs> with with her weapon of choice, which was the kitchen broom. Oh gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so how old were you then, uh, uh, General? Foley? I was in the fourth grade. So what was fourth I, grade? Uh, okay, ten years old. Okay. <laughs> And um, so anyway, she said, you're going to turn in that library card. You're not going to bring home any more books. You're not going to do any more reading. And uh, I'm going to make good use of you on Saturdays from now on. We have chores to do. We need to do the laundry. We need to polish the furniture. We need to do all these other things. So that really changed my whole focus on the weekends of uh, what I was going to do. Well, in fairness to my mom, though, I got to tell you, she um, left school when she was in the ninth grade to work as a seamstress. Yeah. So she understood uh, you're working hard, and uh, she just um, education wasn't one of her top priorities. Yeah. Uh, so, but she instilled in me a strong work ethic. Yeah. The entire time I was home. Okay, the work ethic obviously made it onto the basketball court. 
And you were a star in high school and you had a lot of college offers, but you chose West Point. Can you tell us why? I had a very good uh, high school basketball coach who not only believed in developing basketball skills in me, he believed in developing the right values and instilling the right values like aggressiveness, toughness, good sportsmanship, those kinds of things. My senior year when I was playing in the uh, state tournament in Boston Garden, this one night, I got 44 points and 28 rebounds. Well, I got a big splash in the Boston Globe and Jack Riley, who was the um, head coach of the Army hockey team at West Point, was in Boston uh, looking for hockey players and recruiting them. And so he saw that article and he cut it out, brought it home and gave it to the Army head coach of uh, uh, basketball, George Hunter. Now, I'd gotten 15 full scholarship offices in very good schools. So George Hunter called and talked to my mother and father, and, and uh, he said, I really like to come to the campus for a visit. Well, I told my mother and father, I said, look, you know, I got all these great college, full scholarship offers. I, I really don't think I'm interested in uh, going to a military school. But they had been watching the West Point story at 7.30 Friday night, a 30-minute TV series and it had young actors, Clint Eastwood, Steve McQueen, and they were watching it and they said, you know, I think you should go there and just look at it. So I did. I went up for a weekend and uh, it totally changed my view. I liked the structure. I liked the, the pristine environment, the beautiful campus, and uh, enjoyed the basketball coach and the team concept there. And so when I came back, I said, that's it. I don't want to go to any other place. And so I turned all my tickets in and said, this is it. This is where I want to go to school. So you played against a lot of great athletes there. Can you give us some names of some some people that, that our listeners would know about that you played basketball against? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you about one game we played against Ohio State, 1961. Wow. And I uh, played against Jerry Lucas, 6'8", 240 pounds. And I kept them to 28 points, though. <laughs> Only 28 <laughs> points, okay. Yeah. All right. And it's John Havlicek, wow. Mel Noel, Siegfried, and Bobby Knight. Wow. That was their starting five. They wow. won the national championship that year. Wow. Yeah. No, that was that was that was a great game to watch. But no, it was it was exciting playing against some of those great players. But you were a star and a leader of the West Point team. But academically, and I can relate to this, that was another story. You graduated 497 out of a class of 504. To be fair, some of it was because you became deathly ill and missed a lot of class. But you know, finally, years later, you became the commandant of cadets, which for our listeners, he was in charge of all the cadets at West Point. Right. How did that happen? Right. I did. That's a true story. The way I like to tell it is uh, that we graduated over 500 in the class and I was in the 400s. That's, that's one way of looking at it. What was really interesting was when I was commandant, the cadets somehow got my, and passed around my academic records. So they know, all knew where I stood. Yeah. And actually, you would think that they'd make fun of that, but it was inspirational to a lot of cadets. They said, what? You if know? he can do hey. it. <laughs> all right, Dan, over to you. Three years after you graduated West Point, you found yourself in Vietnam um, with the 25th Infantry Division, 27th Infantry. What was your first impressions of the war when you landed in Vietnam? I went there as a mortar platoon leader, and I had a job to do to provide indirect fire support for the battalion, and that's what I focused on. Wasn't thinking about any politics or strategic thinking about why we're there or what we're there for. I was focused on the mission we had and the soldiers that were there. And those are the first things that were on my mind when I was there, it was the first things that were on my mind when I was a, a rifle company commander. Platoon Sergeant Burroughs was my first platoon sergeant. And I was just all eyes and all ears and listening to everything he said. And one day I said to him, I said, platoon sergeant, what do I have to do to be a, to be a good officer? He said, you got to do two things. One, you got to accomplish the mission. A and you're going to do that because you're going to get a lot of training and different schools you're going to go to. And you're going to have um, your, your company commander and other people tell you about the tactics you need to involve. And the second thing is uh, you got to take care of the troops. Now, Let's talk about caring. And for the next two hours, he talked to me about what caring meant, about setting the example, about being there when soldiers are needed, about taking care of soldiers. I never forgot that. 
Now, what most people will know you for are your heroic exploits on November 5th, 1966, that led to you receiving the Medal of Honor. I recommend people go and read the full citation online, but I'd like to read just a few parts of it right now. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. During this action, both radio operators accompanying him were wounded. At grave risk to himself, he defied the enemy's murderous fire and helped the wounded operators to a position where they could receive medical care. Despite his painful wounds, he refused medical aid and persevered in the forefront of the attack on the enemy. Now, again, I urge you to go read the rest of the citation online because that was just a part of the bravery displayed by Lieutenant General Foley. Sir, can you share with our listeners what led to the events of that day? I was a rifle company commander, Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry. We had just come back from a six-day search and destroy operation and came into base camp, really looking forward to hot food, some time off, and getting a chance to recuperate. Let's everybody take a break, get a rest, get dinner tonight, and get them in the beer tent because we're going to be here for a couple of days. Well, I got a warning order in the morning that we're going to have to redeploy to Tainian province that night. Now, the first thing I did was I got together with my platoon sergeant and XO, and I said, hey, I think I need to talk to the whole company. So I brought the whole company to the mess hall. And I want them to hear from me that I, we're no longer going to take a break and that they were going to go on another mission, which was going to be tough for them to swallow. But I wanted them to hear from me. And I also wanted to tell them that it was to support fellow Wolfhound soldiers. They were in a heavy battle with NVA and, and Viet Cong forces. And when I first started talking to the body, you could see their eyes rolling, but they realized the seriousness of the defense that, that there were brother Wolfons out there. They quietly went back to get ready. And that was a great tribute to them. Well, anyway, we took off and flew into Tainan province at 0100 on the morning of 5th November. The 1st Battalion, 27th Infantry Battalion Commander, Major Malloy, called me up and he told me, if we don't do something pretty quick, if we don't take some quick action based on what we're faced up there, I think Charlie Company is going to be annihilated in the morning. And so here's what I want you to do. You're going to have to take your company and you're going to have to conduct the passage of lines through 1st Battalion 27th, bust through the enemy bunker system, link up with Charlie Company, and then form a corridor back through the enemy lines and evacuate all of the casualties, killed and wounded, through to friendly front lines. He said, now, there's a couple other things you need to know. Most of the forces that you're going to hit in there, there's some pretty strong fighters who have a lot of equipment, and we found out later, <laughs> they were in concrete bunkers with overhead cover, which gave them a lot of protection. We didn't know that at the time. And the other thing is, because of the proximity of Charlie Company to the enemy bunker system, you're not going to be able to use artillery, fire, gunships, or uh, close air support. And so I sat there thinking, this is a suicide mission. But if I didn't do it, we didn't do it, who would? So I gathered my platoon leaders together and, and a couple hours before daylight, and I talked to them about only that part of the mission which had us linking up with Charlie Company. I didn't go any further than that because I knew that if we were fortunate enough to link up with Charlie Company, I wasn't about to come back through enemy lines carrying dead and wounded. I was going to go off to the northwest out of the battle area and call in for medical evacuation. Anyway, we kicked off at 7.30 in the morning. We were hit with rocket-propelled grenades and machine gun fires, and they were in some pretty, pretty good bunker systems there. And, you know, the one thing that I'd always worried about in every single operation that I was on was losing momentum. I did not want to lose momentum. And that came from my basketball days. I just felt we got to press, press, press if you're going to win. And you got to keep after it. And I didn't want to lose momentum one bit. Because every time we received enemy fire, I never hit the ground. Because I thought soldiers hit the ground, they're going to have a tough time getting up. I think we'd seen that in previous wars, in World War II and Korea. They didn't want to get up. So I never did. 
And, you know, being six, seven, running around the battlefield, you make a pretty, good, pretty target. good target. Sir. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> but with these long legs, I can move pretty fast. The only ones that had a problem with me was my RTOs because my rule was they stayed 10 meters away from until I needed them. And when I, <laughs> and then they had to get to me as fast as they could because <laughs> I didn't want those antennas around. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. My first platoon sergeant when I joined the Army um, used to make me stay with the lieutenant because I was the RTO. He said, because he was in Vietnam, and he said, don't come near me. <laughs> don't come near me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's what snipers want. That's right. For. Yeah. They could see he'd it. Tell me to, they could see somebody giving orders. He'd tell me to go over there and hang out with the lieutenant. So, sir, what did it feel like to be notified that you would be receiving the Medal of Honor? On the 6th of November, the day after the battle, I received the Silver Star. And I thought that was it. I thought that was all it was. It was 18 months later when I found out that I was going to get the Medal of Honor that was upgraded over time. And the one thing I also should have mentioned was I wear this Medal of Honor, but there were 120 Wolfhound soldiers by my side every step of the way. That's the reason why we were able to accomplish what we did. They went into that battle with the perseverance, determination, and courage they never wavered. They never hesitated. And without them, it wouldn't have happened. In terms of the significance of wearing it, I wear it mainly, and I think about the honor of uh, having served with those soldiers and all the soldiers today that are going out doing great, courageous things. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. VA sends a weekly email to over 13 million veterans that's jammed packed with amazing resources. Subscribe for free at va.gov forward slash vet resources. Is there a member of the Army or extended Army family? that's made a special impact on your life? Would you like to thank them publicly? We're airing an upcoming episode we're calling our Shout Out Special, in which listeners have the opportunity to share stories of how someone has aided them along the way and let them know the impact they've had. If you'd like to give a shout out to someone, please call us and leave a message on our HUA hotline at 703-236-2914 or send us a note to podcast at AUSA.org. That's 703-236-2914 or podcast at AUSA.org. Hua. Welcome back to the show, everyone. We're glad you're here with us on Army Matters with General Robert Foley. Another insight that came out of your experience in Vietnam was the importance of camaraderie. There's a story in your book about it, about a funny moment that happened with you in a well. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, well, this was, uh, we we're out in a battalion exercise. We had an operation that was supposed to leave first thing in the morning. Uh, I was very careful about ensuring that whenever the soldiers came out into eight man loads, that we got them out into a rice paddy where they were vulnerable to enemy fire for only five minutes. That was the rule, that was the standard we went by. Well, the aircraft were coming in and they were about 12 aircraft, but they were late. So I was really upset at the aircraft mission commander. And so I got him on the phone and I was talking to him and started backing up to get out of the way so they could land. And as I did, I fell straight into a well in the corner of the rice paddy. I mean, straight down in over my head. And when that happened, my two RTOs yanked me out because I had my weapons, my M16, ammunition, grenades, maps, and uh, it all, all went under. And so they finally hauled me out. Meanwhile, the helicopters are landing and the soldiers are getting on the aircraft. And the battalion commander, the first thing he sees is me diving back into the well because my M16 was down there. And he said, what's Foley doing? What's going on? I squished my way into the helicopters and as I looked at, at each helicopter, I could see that the troops were really enjoying this. 
They could see that their company commander got a real dunking. <laughs> mm -hmm. The only ones that didn't enjoy it were the helicopter I got on, because you know what they used to fertilize the rice paddies. Oh, yes. So oh, yeah. that was a smelly trip over. And then I had twisted my knee when I fell in. My boot caught on the lip of the well. So as I was going through the search and destroy operation that afternoon, my leg just swelled up. Mm -hmm. So when we finally got back, uh, to the battalion area, the medics took a look at my swollen knee and gave me ice and said, okay, you got to sit down here and we're going to have to keep ice on it. So that's what I did. And I was just laying back against another sandbag bunker. And all of a sudden, about six NCOs were lined up in front of me. And they started singing a song. And you know the song, Ding Dong, Ding Dong Dell? Well, they had the lyrics written out. The only thing I can remember is they started off singing, ding dong, Dell, there's a captain in the well. I don't remember the rest <laughs> of the lyrics that we used, but they were having a lot of fun with this. And when they finished, I just sat there and I said, very funny. And I looked to my left and right to my left with his head high coming straight at me was a bamboo viper. Wow. And I can remember saying, holy. You know what? Yeah. And I leaped backwards. I did a backflip over the sandbag bunker I was leaping against and I landed and that Bamboo Viper went right underneath where I had been sitting. And then I heard, blam, blam, right next to my right ear. And I looked up, and the first time I was standing there with a shotgun, he said, dead snake. Well, I wish you could have seen those NCOs. <laughs> they were <laughs> rolling on the ground, laughing so hard. I never moved again that night. Sir, we could talk about this for another 30 minutes. But talk to our listeners about leadership by walking around. You know, uh, Dan and I have talked about this a lot, but from your perspective, what does that mean? Why is that important to be a leader that walks around? Yeah, it's very important. In fact, from all over the world and different backgrounds and putting them all together. And it was the summer of 96, and I was standing out on Summerall Field. It was hot. And there was a, a retirement ceremony for a four-star general, and and the old guard was out there in their double-thick blues, and so was I, standing right across from him, looking at him. And started thinking, I said, I think I'm going to try and see what these guys do after a ceremony like that. So I followed one of the companies back into the barracks, and we went all the way up to the attic, where they took their uniforms off, hung them up, took all the brass off, and there were three rouge wheels and they stood behind these rouge wheels with medical masks on and rouge dust going up and sweat pouring down and no air conditioners. And I looked around at some of the NCOs and I said, hey, what's wrong with this picture? And I couldn't get a good answer. So I told the regimental commander, first of all, I'm going to get you air conditioners. Secondly, I'm wearing anodized brass. What, what's wrong with that? I'll give you 60 days. It's time to put anodized brass on. Well, two days later, I got a message from the regimental commander. He said, well, we discussed it and the non-commissioned officers like you to revisit that decision because shining brass has been a tradition in the old guard for a long time. Quarterly training brief, at the end of it, I held up two buttons. One was anodized, one wasn't. I said, which one is which? From 10 feet, they couldn't tell. I said, yeah, and people 50 meters away can't tell either. Go to anodized brass. So anyway, 60 days later, the regimental sergeant major came over to me and reported to me. He said, we, we're done. We're anodized brass, everybody. And I said, good. He said, this is a message from the non-commissioned officers. We thank you so much for doing that because what you've done is you have saved eight hours per week, one full day for soldiers' time. And I said, good. That's a good result. Glad to have it. And, you know, you get that by going out to, to listen, like you talked about, you know, out to, to walk around. Sir, now there's another lesson you discuss in your book about the importance of interpersonal relations. And to that highlight, you talk about a story of your time in Korea. Can you tell us about that? Yes. When I was assistant division commander for the 2nd Infantry Division assigned to Camp Casey, Korea, we're on a combined exercise with the Republic of Korea Army. And on the first day, we weren't meeting any of our objectives. There were communications problems and language problems and misunderstandings. And at the end of the day, we hadn't accomplished a thing. So the division commander gathered a group of us together and he said, what, what can we do? We, we've got to fix this thing. And I told him, I said, you know what? I knew a major Kim Dong Jin 
when uh, we were stationed in Korea 18 years earlier. And we had to work very closely together because uh, each of the generals had to make sure they were doing the right thing, going to the right places, didn't overlap. And so we, we gained a very good friendship. And so I told the division commander, I said, you know, he's a real smart guy. Went to Georgetown University. I said, I'll bet that guy is uh, probably a high ranking general right now. So he said, well, go see if you can find him. I said, OK. So I grabbed three Katusa soldiers. I said, hey, here's my problem. I said, see if you can find him, if he's somewhere there. Hey, 30 minutes later, they came back with big smiles on their face. And they said, they said, we found him. I said, really? I said, what's he doing? He said, well, he's a full general. He's the chief of staff of the Korean army. <laughs> and when he found out you were here, he'd like to talk to you right away. So I said, well, put a call through. So uh, put a call through and he got on the line and he said, hey, Bob. He said, uh, this is DJ. He said, I didn't know you were in Korea. We're going to have to go to dinner. And we talked about a few other things. And he said, the staff told me that you're having some uh, problems with your combined exercise. He said, can you tell me about it? So I did. And he said, OK, I want you to uh, follow the training tomorrow just as you had planned. I'll fix the problem. Well, the next day, it was an entirely different situation. There were no problems. We were meeting every objective. There were no communications issues. <laughs> there were no language problems. Everything was going smooth as silk. So um, it, it brought to mind uh, what was mentioned to me in the Brigadier General Orientation course that I took before I went to Korea. Remember the power of interpersonal relationships. And that came across so great because here I was a um, brigadier general 18 years later, and I called a friend of mine who was a major and is now a general, and the benefits of having that interpersonal relationship all those years and that good friendship uh, were really um, you know, uh, immensely powerful and beneficial at a time when we needed them. But I used that story a lot because I would tell others about this, especially when you're dealing with allies or foreign nations. Having that little bit of friendship with other people like that really goes a long way to ensuring that you can get things done. Okay, sir, I need to know. Who paid for that dinner that night? <laughs> oh, no, he did. He invited me down to Seoul to his quarters, and we had dinner, and it was very nice. He, he's a very nice gentleman. And by the way, he didn't stop there. He became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Minister of Defense. So he did, he did pretty well, and, uh, and, and he was a nice guy to boot. All right, so you served as director of Army Emergency Relief Fund. It's an important organization that Dan and I both know since we served on that board with you. Can you tell us more about your time there and the importance of the group? I was director of Army Emergency Relief, which is a great organization. They provide uh, financial assistance to soldiers and their families and uh, for short-term cash flow issues like they don't have enough money to for car repairs or medical bills or uh, initial rent deposit. And um, it's a great organization. And so I really enjoyed working with them. But uh, when I first got there, the, there was a lot of bureaucracy, you know, and I said, I got to cut through this bureaucracy because you want to give the money, put it in the hands of soldiers. People say, well, it's not our policy. It's not this. It's not that. I said, no, I'm, I, we're going to do that. And so I finally, uh, early on, ended up saying uh, that I wanted the, um, all the AER officers, we had about 200 of them around the world, to find a way to say yes. If a soldier or a family member came to them and asked them for money, find a way to say yes. Just if it didn't meet the criteria or the policies, look around and see if we can't help in some other way. But the problem is if, if a soldier or family member comes to get money and we can't give it to them, they go to a payday lender. They're going to pay fines and fees. I mean, that's no good. I was uh, at Fort Leavenworth, and I was giving a presentation on AER to the Commander General Staff College, uh, which is about 1,000 students. And at the end of it, a major in the Air Force stand up and said, sir, I know this family that has a son who's had brain cancer. He's uh, 12 years old. And the mom was on active duty for 14 years, and she had to uh, resign in order to take care of her son. And her husband... Uh, was a soldier also, and he was on uh, uh, active duty for eight years, and he's working right there at the Fort uh, Leavenworth Garrison. They've used up all their savings. They have um, $4,000 in medical bills right now. They don't know what to do, and 
let me just go back. The mom had 14 years. The, her husband had 10 years. That's 24. That's more than the 20 you need for you to retire. So that's good enough for me. And I told the AER uh, section leader, I want you to provide a check this afternoon to that soldier for $4,000 to pay those medical bills. And I want it to be a grant. We could provide interest-free loans or grants. And depending on the need, you know, I said, I want it to be a grant. And for all the medical bills, as long as that family needs them, I want you to take care of the medical bills and make it only grants. Now, one year later, that child's cancer was in, in remission. That's the difference that you can make when you, when you do things like that. And so that, that, that's why I really uh, enjoyed that job. We could talk to General Foley for, for days on end, but you know we're going to have to end our, our podcast here. So thank you so much for, uh, for being a, a true uh, hero to our, our nation and, and someone that we, we looked up to. And, and we're looking forward to seeing you out and about. Uh, continue to talk about your book, Standing Tall, Leadership Lessons in the Life of a Soldier. And thank you again for joining us here on Army Matters. Well, thank you, General Smith and Sergeant Major. And, and I've listened to some of these podcasts, and I just want to compliment you on how well you do. Thank you. It's very educational. It's informative. It's enjoyable. You do it at a very relaxed tone so people can, can enjoy it. And uh, I think you're doing a, an awful lot for the Army and for the listening audience. And I appreciate what you do. Well, thank you, sir. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Barrow Heckes. Anthony Del Call is the producer and writer, and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Barrow Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five-star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast can also be heard on Reese Across America Radio on Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, on the iHeartRadio app, the Odyssey app, and the TuneIn app with the search of the word Reese. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm with Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hooah.